today we're going to be discussing the fourth element of weather and climate, which is moisture. We've already discussed the three elements of weather and climate prior to moisture. They are temperature, wind, and pressure. And if you remember the last time we met, we talked about how wind and pressure are related and produce various types of weather situations at strategic degrees of latitude. The polar front at 60 degrees north latitude and south latitude. Subtropical high at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And the intertropical convergence zone along the equator. One thing we did not talk a great deal about was how or what type of results do we get as a result of this relationship between wind and pressure? And if you remember our discussion of convergence and divergence, these two concepts relate specifically to the probability of some type of precipitation occurring in the atmosphere. An area of convergence, for example, will generally produce a great deal of precipitation because the air is coming together and it is rising at a given area. And as a result, you're going to have the air having less of an ability to hold moisture that's in it. And eventually, you're going to get some type of precipitation. On the other hand, zones of divergence are areas where the air is sinking or diverging. And as the air sinks, it has a tendency to heat up. And as a result, it has a greater ability to hold the moisture that's in it. And so what we'd like to do today is emphasize on the convergence part. In other words, how does the situation of air cooling as a result of air rising contribute to precipitation? And in order to understand this, we need to review a number of concepts relating to the change of moisture in the atmosphere from one form to another. And so this is what we're going to be doing this morning. And so as I did last time, I'm going to show you some transparencies with some of these basic terms and concepts identified. What we're talking about generally is one of the more basic concepts in geography, especially in physical geography. And this concept is the hydrologic cycle. Specifically, the hydrologic cycle describes the way in which water changes from one form to another form within the atmosphere. We know that water is matter. And we also know that matter has weight, which we found out the last time. And since matter has weight, it has a tendency to be in three forms, or at least one of three forms. It can either be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. And so water, being matter, and having weight, it too occurs in three forms, in the form of a gas, in the form of a liquid, and in the form of a solid. And these are the forms of water as they appear in the atmosphere. First of all, water in the form of a gas in the atmosphere is referred to as water vapor. A gas is invisible for the most part. And water vapor is invisible. The atmosphere always 
has a certain amount of water vapor in it, even though we can't see it. And it is one of the most important mechanisms by which we get some type of precipitation. Also, water in the form of a liquid in the atmosphere is referred to as rain. And then water in the form of a solid in the atmosphere is referred to as sleet, snow, and hail. Now we're all familiar with these forms of precipitation as they are called. In other words, there are four forms of precipitation. Rain, sleet, snow, and hail. So when we talk about moisture in the atmosphere, we're either talking about moisture in the form of water vapor or moisture in some form of precipitation, either rain, sleet, hail, or snow. Now what we're mainly interested in is understanding the way in which these forms of water changes from one state to another state in the atmosphere. We're not so interested in each individual form of water as it exists in the atmosphere, but rather the way in which water changes from one state to another state. This is how we understand the various weather situations that we have in various areas. And so this is what we want to emphasize on. And so the next thing that we can consider by looking at the transparency is the stages within which water changes from one form to another. And basically, there are three stages. And the first stage is when water changes from a gas to a liquid. When water changes from a gas to a liquid, we call this process condensation. In order for condensation to occur, there needs to be atmospheric cooling. So in other words, as the air cools, essentially it loses its ability to hold the moisture that's in it, that is to hold the water vapor that's in it, water in the form of a gas, and eventually the air will cool to the point where water vapor will change from a gas to a liquid. And this process is called condensation. Now when water vapor changes from a gas to a liquid, what happens is that you have clouds being developed. And as clouds develop, <coughs> you have with further atmospheric cooling, some form of precipitation. And so this is the first stage of the hydrologic cycle. The second stage of the hydrologic cycle is when you have gas being changed from the water vapor in the air to some type of solid. And as the air cools, the rate of air cooling can be so great that the water vapor that's present in the atmosphere will be transformed directly from a gas to solid, that is, hail, sleet, or snow. If the atmospheric cooling is not that great, then the change will be from a gas, that is, water vapor, to a liquid which is rain. And then finally, you have a situation by which after precipitation in some form reaches the Earth's surface, it has a tendency to eventually evaporate into the atmosphere. And so this is the third and final stage of the hydrologic cycle. In other words, when water in either a liquid or a solid form is transformed back into a gaseous state. And this process is referred to as evaporation. 
And in order to have evaporation, you have to have atmospheric heating. Now, this is pretty common, much more so than the process of condensation. It's very common that as air heats up, it has a tendency to evaporate any water that might be in a liquid state. And so these are the three stages of the hydrologic cycle and how they change the form of water from a gas to a liquid or solid and then back to a gas. Now these are some other terms that you need to remember relating to the hydrologic cycle. They're very important. What you can do is summarize the definition of these terms and you need to integrate these terms in with what we already discussed concerning the hydrologic cycle. So the first one is saturation, sometimes referred to as capacity. And it is defined as the maximum amount of water vapor the air can hold at a given temperature. When something is saturated, it is holding the maximum amount of water that it can hold at a given temperature. And so this is saturation. The dew point is also very important. The dew point specifically is the temperature at which the air condenses. That is, it is a temperature at which water change from a liquid form to a liquid. Excuse me, it changes from uh, a liquid form to a gas, as it says here. Point. Now keep in mind that dew point is simply temperature, the temperature at which condensation takes place. And then the next term is clouds. Now we are very familiar with clouds just about every day we go outside, we look up and we see clouds, but very seldom do we try to analyze what a cloud is. We don't go around trying to figure out different types of clouds, even though if you really consider the various types of clouds, uh, there are many of them, and it's really very interesting to, to look at the various types of clouds. But as far as understanding the hydrologic cycle, we need to realize what a cloud is, and it's pretty basic. As the definition shows here, we can define clouds as billions of tiny water droplets suspended in the air. And basically what you have happening is the coalescing of moisture, that is the coalescing or coming together of water vapor around dust nuclei in the atmosphere. In the air, you have billions and billions of microscopic dust nuclei floating around. And so the moisture, the water vapor that's in the atmosphere, has a tendency to coalesce or form around these billions of dust nuclei. And uh, when we get these billions and billions of water droplets clinging to dust nuclei forming a cloud, this is what we see. Okay, the next term is precipitation. Precipitation, as we've mentioned before, is water in a liquid or a solid form. And then finally, there is surface runoff. Surface runoff is the flow of water down slope to the oceans. Now in addition to surface runoff, you also have subsurface runoff. In 
other words, what happens sometimes, especially in a topographic area that is relatively flat, instead of water flowing downslope, you have water seeping into the ground or infiltrating into the ground. And what happens is that water will infiltrate beneath the surface until it reaches the water table. In other words, it reaches an area that is completely saturated beneath the surface. At that point, you will have no other or further infiltration. And this area of saturation beneath the surface, which is essentially subsurface water, the top of which is the water table, this area filled with water or saturated with water has a tendency to flow downhill being affected by the gravitational pull, very similar to the way in which uh, surface water is affected by the Earth's gravitational pull. So these are some very important concepts that you need to keep in mind as you think in terms of this hydrologic cycle. It is a process by which water changes its form from a liquid to a gas to a solid and back to a liquid. Okay, are there any questions on any of this? If you have any questions, please ask. Okay, the next two transparencies I'm going to show you are visual indicators of the hydrologic cycle. And what you will see is what actually happens in a given area as far as water changing from one state to another state. Now I'm going to show you two of these uh, pictures illustrating the hydrologic cycle just to give you a slightly different perspective. But basically what you see is what we've talked about before, that is evaporation condensation, precipitation, and surface runoff, and in some cases, subsurface runoff. And you have a cycle going all over again, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, surface runoff, subsurface runoff. And so you have the greatest amount of evaporation then over your oceans because this is where you find the greatest source of water in a liquid form, over the oceans. And this is especially true in your tropical areas. So not only do you have a significant source of water to be evaporated, to be calm, potentially, water vapor in the air, but also the air is quite warm. And as we know, warm air has a tendency to evaporate water from the surface. And so you have a great deal of evaporation over tropical oceans especially. And of course, as air rises, it cools off, and it will cool off to the point where the air cannot hold the water vapor that's in it. And at that point, the air will condense. That is, the air will get to a point where it will become saturated with water vapor. And any further cooling of the atmosphere will cause a change from water being in a gaseous state to water being in a liquid state. And this is when you will have clouds developing, as you see here. And eventually, you will have precipitation as cooling continues and as precipitation, even in the form of rain, sleet, snow, or hail, as it reaches the Earth's surface, it will flow downslope as surface runoff, or it will flow beneath the surface as subsurface runoff, and it will reach, eventually, the oceans, where it will return back to the atmosphere as water vapor. And so you have the cycle continuing on and on and on. And this is what has been happening over uh, thousands and even millions of years over the Earth's physical existence. Okay, now, are there any questions 
about this particular transparency. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to show you another transparency that pretty much shows the same thing, but it's more colorful and it gives you a slightly different perspective on the way in which air rises in order for cooling to take place, in, in order for condensation to eventually occur. Now, on this particular transparency, you have the same situation as you saw in the last transparency. That is, you have evaporation being most extensive in your oceans, and particularly in your tropical oceans. So you have evaporation from oceans. Eventually, the air will rise and cool off to the point where it cannot hold any more of the water vapor that's in it. In other words, it will reach its dew point. And at that point, you will have your clouds developing. And as air continues to cool, eventually the cloud droplets or water droplets making up the cloud will become too heavy to remain in the cloud and will fall either as rain, sleet, snow, or hail. And eventually as the rain reaches the surface, you will get either infiltration, water seeping beneath the surface if it's a flat terrain, or if it's a fairly rugged terrain, you will have water flowing off of the surface, down slope, and eventually back into the ocean. Of course, you will also have subsurface uh, runoff. Okay, any uh, questions? What is transpiration? Transpiration is the evaporation of uh, water from plants. So it's a more specific term. Ev evaporation is a general term. Transpiration is a more specific term denoting the evaporation of water from plants and vegetation in general. Okay, now the last thing that I want to mention today is extremely important as it relates to understanding why the hydrologic cycle takes place in the first place. At this point, you should have a very good understanding of the hydrologic cycle as a process. But what are the components which contribute to this process occurring? And so this is what we want to look at now uh, by considering a number of, uh, of things related to what we called relative humidity. And this is a definition of relative humidity. Now, humidity itself, before I talk about relative humidity, humidity itself is simply the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, specifically the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Now, relative humidity is a comparison. It's a comparison between, as it says here, the actual amount of water vapor in the atmosphere and the maximum amount of water vapor that the air can hold at some temperature. So as you consider relative humidity, you need to think of it in terms of not a definition, but in terms of a process, in terms of a concept. And this concept involves moisture in the atmosphere, the actual amount of moisture in the atmosphere, compared to the maximum amount of moisture in the atmosphere at some given temperature. <coughs> now, the way in 
which I'm going to explain relative humidity, which is very important to understand, but it's very basic, is to make an analogy with a glass of water. Okay, and we can assume then that with our glass of water, as it says here, the height of the glass equals the temperature of the air. The area within the glass equals the volume of air. And finally, water in the glass equals the amount of water vapor. Now, water vapor is measured in grain. So we're assuming that we have this situation as far as our glass of water is concerned. Okay, so if we fill a glass of water half full with uh, water, then obviously our glass would be 50% filled. Well, this is analogous to a given volume of air holding half the amount of water vapor that it can hold at some given temperature. And so therefore, the relative humidity would be 50%. Okay, again, the height of the glass represents the temperature of the air. The area within the glass represents a given volume of air. And uh, the water within the glass represents water vapor. Now, there are two ways in which water vapor might change within the atmosphere. Two ways, two primary ways in which water vapor might change within the Earth's atmosphere. It's very important to keep these items in mind. First of all, relative humidity changes when the amount of water vapor change and the air temperature remains constant. When the amount of water vapor change and the air temperature remains constant. And so what you see here are the glasses of water being analogous to a volume of air with a certain amount of water vapor in it. Here we have our glasses of water with a certain amount of water in it. And over here, we see that uh, the glass is half filled with water, which is a more technical way of saying that it is 50% full. Of course, when you want a glass of water, you know, tell someone that you want a glass of water that is 50% filled with water, you tell them that I want a glass of water that is half filled. Okay, now, if we would pour some of this water out to the point where the height of the glass is the same, representing the fact that temperature remains the same, but we pour some of the water out. And if there's only this amount of water in the glass, then we might say that uh, the glass is filled at only 20%. It's only 20% filled with water. Very little amount of water in the glass. So this is analogous to 20% uh, relative humidity. In other words, there are situations when there is a decrease in the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. In other words, temperature does not change, but rather the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere decreases. For example, if you remember when we were talking about the subtropical high pressure area, where you have a zone of divergence, you have air sinking, and heating up, and it's a basic principle that warm air can hold more moisture than cool air. 
And so when you have a situation of divergence where air is sinking and heating up, you're going to have the air, of course, being much warmer and the relative amount of water vapor in a given volume of very warm air will be very low because warm air can hold so much more water vapor than cool air. By the same token, of course, we could increase the amount of water in the glass, not quite filled, but to, say, 75% filled. And, of course, this would be analogous to a volume of air having a relative humidity of 75%. And then, of course, we could fill the glass of water up to the top. It would be 100% filled. And this is analogous to a volume of air being uh, saturated, where the relative humidity is 100%. And then, of course, we can continue pouring water in our glass, but of course, what you will experience then will be an overflow. Water will literally spill out. And this is analogous to water vapor saturating a given volume of air and with more water vapor being added to the air, it spills out. Of course, we don't say it spills out. We say that it condenses. The volume of air releases the uh, moisture or the water vapor that's in it. And so this is analogous to condensation. So in other words, whenever you experience uh, filling a glass so full of water that the water overflows, then you can think of condensation if you, if you ever have that experience. A more common situation that I'd like for you to remember is a situation by which you have a change in temperature with the water vapor content being constant. This will likewise produce a change in relative humidity. Keep in mind, up here, the change in relative humidity was due simply to either an addition or a subtraction of water vapor in a given volume of air. Obviously, the more water vapor you have in a volume of air, the greater the proportion of water vapor in that volume of air, or the greater the the uh, relative humidity, assuming that the temperature remains unchanged. And conversely, the less amount of water vapor is in a given volume of air, the lower the relative humidity. But what happens usually in the atmosphere is that you have a tremendous change in the temperature. And this is what causes water vapor to condense when you have the significant change in temperature, usually a decrease in temperature. And so the diagrams at the bottom of the transparency illustrate uh, the situation when you have a change in the temperature of the air, but the water vapor content remains constant. So again, you have the glass here indicating the temperature, the volume in the glass indicating the volume of air that you're dealing with, and the water in the glass representing water vapor. So again, assuming that the same amount of water is in a glass, then if you could magically increase the height of this glass, this would be the same as increasing your temperature. And as you increase the height of the glass, having the same amount of water vapor in it, then obviously your relative humidity is going to decrease. This glass is half filled with water, so its relative humidity is 50%. This glass, having the same amount of water in it, or glass itself, increases in height. The, there is a uh, less amount of water in the glass relative to the height of the glass. And so now the glass is only 25% filled, this taller glass. Now, 
if we would lower the glass, if we would have the ability to lower the height of the glass with the same amount of water in it, we could lower it to a point where the glass becomes filled. Our lower glass is filled now with water. And this is analogous to the atmosphere having a relative humidity of 100%. The important thing to remember is not so much the water in the glass analogy, but to remember the effect of temperature on water vapor in a given volume of air. And this relationship is summarized by these two items over here at the lower left, uh, lower right hand corner of the uh, transparency. And it says air heating is related to relative humidity decreases. Air cooling is related to relative humidity increases. It's extremely important to remember these two basic relationships. Okay, are there any uh, questions? questions. Okay, the next time we're going to look at some specific items relating to the condensation of water vapor in the atmosphere. We're not going to pay as great attention to the evaporation stage of the hydrologic cycle, but rather the condensation stage of the hydrologic cycle and see how precipitation is produced as a result.